All right, well, my next guest is a conference speaker, a radio talk show host, and an author of a very interesting book entitled Israelistine, The Ancient Blueprints of the Future Middle East. His name is Bill Salas. Bill, thanks for joining me today on Follow the Money Weekly Radio. Well, Jerry, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Bill, I want to talk to you uh, about your book, Israelistine. I have it right here in front of me. Before we do, I want to tackle some of the news that has been coming out of the nation of Israel. I've been to Israel twice, uh, once on a pilgrimage, the other was on business. I find the country to be very fascinating. It's a small country. It's no bigger than the size of, I guess, New Jersey. It's a, it's a fairly well, it's a very small country. Yet the country has produced more Nobel Prize winners per capita than any other nation. Uh, the Israeli people are very resourceful. Over 90% of their homes are powered by some sort of solar power. They're a huge magnet for venture capital, uh, number one in the world per capita. And Israel, this is kind of a shocker, Israel has more NASDAQ-listed companies than any country besides the United States. So science and technology, they're leading the field in these areas. And now there's a new report that I was reading this week, Bill, that shows that Israel has the fastest rising property market anywhere around the world right now. What's happening in the Israeli economy right now? Well, that not that interesting? Amidst the global economic meltdown and a backlash of new mortgage foreclosures coming across America, Jerry, that actually Israel is experiencing a real estate housing boom. And I, being a Christian Zionist who believes that God has plans for Israel and he's, he's starting to carry them out, uh, see that this isn't, you know, we shouldn't be surprised at, the, at that if we're Christians. And But Israel is experiencing a real estate housing boom. Matter of fact, Fox News, uh, Bill Hel- Hemmer on there uh, just a few weeks ago, early October, he did a special on this housing boom, uh, well, had a segment on there. And uh, For instance, in Tel Aviv, high-rise condos that they're building are starting at $20 million apiece. Now, the average income in Israel is about $30,000 a year, but the supply and demand is, is definitely hitting over Israel. A lot of rich money is getting over there. Jerusalem, for instance, is up 20% this year alone in real estate activity, and New apartments, just basic apartments in, in Jerusalem, are starting at a million dollars, and like a thousand square foot, you know, apartment that's already existing is is starting at six hundred thousand. And interestingly, out in my neck of the woods here in Southern California, the San Bernardino, San Bernardino Sun newspaper came out on October sixteenth uh, with an article called "Israel's is seeing a housing boom," and uh, they quoted a study done by the Global Property Guide. And Israel ranks six out of 36 of the fastest growing housing markets in the world. But when you consider that four of the top five, including like Singapore and Lativa, where they're rebounding from sharp uh, price drops, Israel actually clocks in at number one in housing in the world in this study uh, during the second quarter of 2010. And they're also experiencing um, growth in energy. Uh, they've ha- they've discovered in 2009. It was, it was called the Tamar One. It turned out to be the largest natural gas discovery in the world for that year. And this year, they discovered a huge uh, natural gas co- uh, deposit, and they're calling it Leviathan, which may turn out, Jerry, to be the number one uh, this year as well, natural gas deposit. So isn't it quite amazing that Israel is going through these things? And, and I would uh, I would say that this, you know, I, I, as you know, I'm a Bible prophecy author, and it said in Ezekiel 36, uh, verse 7 on through, uh, verses 10 and 11, that there would come a time when the Israel would be reformed, uh, the the land would be tilled and sown, men would be multiplied upon it, cities would be inhabited, ruins rebuilt, and literally it says that in that process that Israel would be dealt with even better than at their beginning. So I, I think we might even be, even be seeing God's uh, hand on this presently on Israel, the old client nation of God, the old uh, chosen people. Isn't that amazing? Well, back here in the United States, you know, we're dealing with all of the political turmoil. And, uh, of course, the midterm elections are just next week. The president's approval ratings, according to many outlets, are showing that he's taking a beating. I mean, it's very, very uh, dismal uh, as you look at some of the uh, Democratic, especially some of the upper tier uh, approval rating numbers. And even for Congress in general, one of the anti-big government movements that really began here in America was the Tea Party movement. Uh, that really gained steam over the last couple of years. However, I was reading in the news this week as well uh, that many of the anti-Obama crowd in Israel uh, have started their own version of Tea Party in Israel. So what's that all about? 
Well, that's interesting. Matter of fact, you know, this is a new grassroots development over there that pretty much proves to be as patriotic and provocative and antagonistic toward Obama in Israel as, as this American version is, they're billing it as over there. And, and while trick-or-treaters are running around here in America on October 31st, they're going to hold their first open open rally um, at a Zionist organization over there in Tel Aviv. So it's amazing. And really what this is, it's being modeled after the American conservative social movement, the Tea Party, and their banner is saying no to Obama because what they're concerned about is that after our midterm elections, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is going to get an enormous amount of pressure, and they're worried that Netanyahu may cave in on, under this pressure from the Obama administration to uh, put another moratorium again on, on build, building houses in the settlement areas there in the West Bank. You know that They had a 10-month moratorium on housing over there so that they could try to have peace talks with the Palestinians, and that expired on September 26th, and then construction started again, and the peace talks fell flat on their face. So they're concerned now that they're going to go ahead and uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure that after the election, midterm elections that Obama is going to put an additional amount of pressure on them. And, you know, that's that's not an unwarranted concern. Uh, when King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia came over here on June 29th of 2010, reportedly Obama was asking King Abdullah for his support to help us with our Afghanistan quagmire. You know, we've been over in Afghanistan now almost 10 years now, Jerry. That's how long the Russians were there before they licked their wounds and pulled out. And uh, Abdullah had told Obama he could help, but in turn, here's the concern, he wanted Obama to uh, persuade, if you will, if not force Israel to accept King Abdullah's Saudi peace initiative that he formed in 2002 to form peace over there. And really what that peace initiative is a no-go for Israel. It talked about Israel going receding back to its pre-1967 borders, which is when they almost tripled their size in that six-day war, you might recall. And it talks about giving up the Golan Heights to Syria, giving back East Jerusalem for part of the capital of the Palestinian state, having uh, several million Palestinian refugees come back into this reduced Israel, and uh, so the concern is that a pivotal break point here is these midterm elections. That, that you know, the next thing you know, they're going to be given pressure. Obama administration is going to give pressure after that. Now, World Net Daily came out with an article along these lines too. Aaron Klein, who reports over there on, this came out on January 26th. It said Obama's wrath is headed. Where, where is Obama's ha uh, wrath headed after the midterms? And it says the president was holding back. You know, believes acting now could harm the Democrats. Well, as you said. <laughs> You know, right now there's enough concerns that the Congress may be swayed Republican after these midterms and things like that, that uh, the, the concerns is Obama doesn't really want to do anything volatile in the Middle East, but uh, the, the, uh, the general consensus in Israel right now, especially the right-wing element over there, is they're very concerned after the elections that uh, pressure is going to heat up again on Benjamin Netanyahu to free settlements and uh, so on and so forth. And also the other concern is there is a, uh, a suggestion going around that the United Nations, by August of 2011, if peace isn't established between the Palestinians and the Jews, is going to force a unilateral state, a Palestinian state over there. And, and there's concerns among many Israeli Jews that Obama's administration will support that. That is not a bilateral peace talk. That would be a unilateral peace forced down Israel's throat. And, and you know, really... That that's going to probably provoke the war that everybody's concerned about, that type of behavior. The war drum's been beating for some time, especially uh, over the last couple of years re regarding Iran. Uh, what is the current temperature right now with the Iran-Israel conflict? The U.S. was talking about some time, uh, you know, moving into Iran and possibly trying to neutralize uh, the uh, Ahmadinejad government. You have your finger on the pulse over there in the Middle East. What's happening with Iran and Israel regarding the conflict going on? Boy, that is a that is really the hot button right now. As you know, going back to the, the, the basic elements, you've got Ahmadinejad is an apocalyptically minded Shiite Muslim who has said since October of 2005 at the World Without Zionism conference that he hosted in Tehran, that he wants to wipe Israel off the map, and Israel takes this threat very seriously. He learned earlier that year, in February of 2005, that he would uh, he, he signed a contract with Russia to help him develop the nuclear 
plants they've got going now. Of course, they went red hot, meaning their first nuclear plant opened on August 21st, the Bashar nuclear plant. But he knew he would have nuclear weapons so that he could literally wipe Israel off the map. And that is, Israel takes that very seriously because Ahmadinejad, he believes that by provoking an apocalyptic condition in the Middle East, he's, he's actually called by Allah, he believes, to do that so that he could invite the return or provoke the return of the 12th Imam, the Mahdi, the Islamic Shiite Messiah. He thinks that he's going to create an a, a apocalyptic condition to bring back this Messiah. But, you know, this is a grave concern to Israel, but, you know, it's not only a concern to Israel because it turns out um, a lot of the Sunni Muslims over there, they tend to be a little more moderate. They're, they're centered around uh, Saudi Arabia and, and over in Jordan. A lot of them are Sunnis there, different faction of Islam. They're very concerned that Ahmadinejad has much, much broader reaching aspirations in the Middle East than just wiping Israel off. They see his end game trying to form a Shiite crescent in that fertile crescent over there. Uh, King of, and that's a term that was coined by uh, King Abdul II of Jordan back in, I think it was the end of 2004, he called it a Shia crescent, and he saw uh, threats coming from the Iranian regime that they wanted to go ahead and take over the Middle East, beginning through Damascus, on through uh, Baghdad, on, you know, and even through Lebanon, and then coming down through uh, getting uh, the Jews wiped out, Israel wiped out, they could form a proxy Palestinian state over there, then they could easily move over to Jordan. I mean, this is all very much a, uh, a thought and process a strategy and process because, for instance, Jordan is 65% Palestinian, so they would fall. Iraq presently, you know, the, 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 uh, with Hussein being gone, Iran and Iraq had an eight-year war in 1980 through 1988, and this, of course, was when Ahmadinejad wanted to exert his influence over the, uh, Iran wanted to exert their influence over Iraq. Now they're going to try to probably do it politically because we're pulling out, and they're trying to prop up a pro-Iranian government. But in Iraq, but you know, I mean, if it, I mean, I can go on a long time about this, but the point is, what this has got ultimately, where this is going, is Saudi Arabia, the number one uh, producer within OPEC, is very concerned about Iran wanting to come on down into Saudi Arabia, take over Saudi Arabia, take over the two holiest sites of, sites of Islam, Mecca and Medina, and take over the oil over there. And so Saudi Arabia has just contracted with America to buy sixty billion dollars of arms and predominantly uh, fighter jets and aircraft, largest transaction in American history. They're not doing that because, uh, yes, they do have a lot of money, but you know they're doing that because they're very concerned about Iran's broader reaching aspirations. Bill, you know, one of the major concerns that, that we have here uh, at our organization is obviously the breakdown of the petrodollar system in which oil is priced in dollars, and that arrangement, you know, goes back to the to the 1970s when a, a, a deal was brokered between the United States and Saudi Arabia to protect their oil fields and all of this. There is a sense or a fear that uh, the last thing we need right now is a powder keg uh, going off you know, in the Middle East. Based upon everything that you're seeing now, what, how, how soon do you think that we could be staring at a major conflict escalating in that area? Well, I concur with you because we are still trying to recover from this global economic crisis, and the last thing we need is the oil-drenched Middle East to break out in apocalyptic wars. And you know, Jerry, as I write about in my book, the Bible does foretell prophetically the coming of some powerful Mideast wars, and there'll be an Arab-Israeli conflict that is going to be the mother of all Mideast wars described in Psalm 83, and then that is supposedly looks like it'll be followed by an even bigger invasion and guess who's in that second invasion that's iran iran who's in the news today and that's also a consortium of, of confederacy you've got russia and iran and turkey turkey of course now is very anti-israel you've been seeing them in the news a lot as well so how how close are we to a conflict and will that conflict be just another skirmish because those are pretty commonplace in the middle east or will it be the mother of all Middle east wars this is this has got a, uh, many of us at the edge of our seats trying to figure this out because you know, when you when diplomacy fails, wars break out. This is the way it's always been. And everybody is frantically, even the Pope at the Vatican, it says peace is urgent now. Peace is possible. He just concluded a two-week synod out of the Vatican. And everybody's very concerned about the timing right now. If we don't, Even King Abdullah II of Jordan said, if you don't get peace in the Middle East by the end of the year, there could be another major war. So everybody's understanding that there's just not a lot of time left on the peace clock. 